In my last lecture, I talked about an artist's vision and how personal experience might help shape the way he or she approached the subject of a painting. For this discussion, I deliberately chose two artists with remarkably similar styles who worked in the same city and more or less in the same period. So now let's move on to the cultural, social, religious, and political context in which these works were produced. So my first question is, why was Judith and Holofernes such a popular topic in the late 1500s and early 1600s, or as historians confusingly say, the late 16th and early 17th century? Well, this was an age of brutal religious wars when the Protestant Reformation was sweeping across Europe and the Catholic Church was engaged in a vigorous counter-reformation. Art was a major battleground of these wars. Protestants were uncomfortable with images of saints and the Virgin Mary. They also tended to reject appeals to emotion as opposed to reason. The Catholic Church, on the other hand, fought unabashedly to win over hearts with vivid, dramatic religious paintings. There were other reasons why the story of Judith and Holofernes was a popular subject of Italian Catholic art, aside from the fact that it was quite a story. Uh, the book of Judith was not included in the Protestant canon, so it was a reinforcement to some extent of, the, of Catholicism. Judith was a warrior for the faith, and the Pope was calling for a holy war against Protestants. The highly theatrical style also reflected the huge popularity of Italian opera, note especially the theatrical lighting. I just add that while Caravaggio and Gentileschi were both popular Catholic counter-reformation painters, Caravaggio was much more controversial with the church. You might think that as a female artist, Artemisia Gentileschi would be more controversial, but in fact, she was in very good standing. Church leaders liked her paintings a lot. Caravaggio, on the other hand, criticized the church as too distant from the people, and his paintings celebrated the role ordinary people played in Bible stories, so he frequently used people from the streets, as we saw even prostitutes, as models. So now we're going to move backward in time five centuries. This is an illuminated, that is, illustrated manuscript page from a 12th century French Bible. So, of course, this is before the printing press. Now, I had to hunt hard for this image, and the reason may well lie in the context of the High Middle Ages. The Judith and Holofernes narrative was not especially popular in this period. Any thoughts about why that might be the case? Well, Catholic Christian narratives in this period tended to center on Mary or martyred female saints. I'm guessing that maybe Judith seemed a little dangerous and bloodthirsty to patrons of that era, in particular as a woman attacking a figure of authority, she might have been perceived as challenging. High Middle Ages, more high, rigidly hierarchical culture. After all, the lords of Israel uh, in the story proved not to be up to the job of defending their people. And that might have seemed a subversive message in an era when feudal lords dominated the political and social structure and, in fact, were expected to protect their people. That was why they got to be on top. Uh, just stay tuned for Joan of Arc. Remember what I said about how an artist must choose which part of a story to capture in a single work? What message might the artist's choice be sending? Why this particular moment in the Judith story? Well, here the artist has chosen a moment when Judith, in essence, resubmits to Israel's ruling authority. Uh, we should also keep in mind that illuminated manuscripts would have been seen by a very limited audience. Basically, individuals who could read would have been primarily monks, some nuns. So notice that Judith is presented in an almost nun-like likeness. There's no revenging sex pot in this drawing. So here's an early Renaissance Judith. This painting presents evidence of Renaissance preoccupation. So we see Judith's flowing robes, which look almost classical. This was a time when ancient learning was being revived, particularly Greek. Her expression, likewise, is really more thoughtful than avenging, as depicts an era known for the revival of reason. Judith, by the way, was a very popular figure in Renaissance Florence, which was Botticelli's hometown. We'll see another image and explore just why. So here is a bronze cast sculpture by another very famous Florentine Renaissance artist, Donatello. This work was commissioned by Donatello's patron and protector, the leader of Republican Florence, Cosimo de' Medici. 
Donatello needed protecting, by the way, since his rather blatant homosexuality violated Florentine laws. More on that after Christmas. Anyway, art historians believe that this was the inscription on the granite pedestal originally. Quote, kingdoms fall through luxury, cities rise through virtues. Behold the neck of pride severed by the hand of humility. In other words, this dramatic statue is intended as a metaphor for Medici rule. Cosimo de' Medici, although a very wealthy man, made a point of appearing modest, uh, not being ostentation in his wealth, and being seen as the leader of a Republican Florence, not as a dictator. And so he wanted to be seen as the defender of Florentine liberty, much as Judith was the slayer of the tyrant Holofernes and the defender of the Israelites. Uh, this view is supported by accounts that mention a second inscription on the pedestal, which read, The Salvation of the State. Piero de' Medici, son of Cosimo, dedicates the statue both to liberty and to fortitude, whereby the citizens with unvanquished and constant heart might return to the Republic. Uh, Florence was always under attack from major empires, France, the Holy Roman Empire, and also subject to a lot of internal civil wars. Originally, Judas stood next to Donatello's David, which you see here in the garden of the Medici Palace. Do you see a, a connection in content here that might relate to this context? Content is what the story is about. Context, again, is a sort of political, social, religious environment in which it was produced. Well, David was another protector of Israel, a slayer of tyrants and a representative of the little guy fighting big, scary people. Uh, and so, again, he was a very popular subject for Florentine artists. You all, I'm sure, know Michelangelo's David, which we'll study later in the course. This statue was later moved to a place of honor in front of the seat of government, the Palazzo Vecchio, or Town Hall. Ironically, it was moved there to celebrate the expulsion of Cosimo de' Medici's great-grandson, Piero de' Medici, and the reestablishment of Florence's republic. Although this specific image isn't included in the College Board image list, the entire Sistine Chapel is. This fresco is found in one of the corners at the side of the entrance. In the other corner is the fresco with David killing Goliath. So we see still another pairing of these two stories. Notice that Holofernes' headless body is foreshortened to create a sense that the legs are kicking their way out of the painting. This reflects a Renaissance fascination with perspective and mathematically accurate representatives of bodies in space. Now, Baroque artists would add an element of theatricality to this. They use foreshortening and the way paintings were cut off to create figures that seem to be spilling into the audience space. And to some extent, actually, uh, this work is kind of a transitional work between the Renaissance uh, and Baroque art. Here, by the way, is a detail from the painting. Some heart historians believe that Holofernes' head was a self-portrait of Michelangelo. We knew he drew, he drew himself into at least one other place in the Sistine Chapel. We'll talk about that later as well. Uh, Michelangelo was tormented by doubts about his salvation, uh, struggles with the church during, again, this very difficult time. So while the Judith narrative was generally more popular with Catholics, at least one famous Reformation painter also tackled the narrative. You've probably seen this painting of Martin Luther, if only as an illustration in a history book. This work by Cranach, uh, this is a work by Cranach, who was really the painter of the Reformation, who was a very close friend of Luther's, was actually best man at his wedding. So why would the story of Judith resonate with Protestants, uh, as well as Catholics during the age of religious wars? Well, it's important to remember that German Protestants were trying to win their independence from Catholic Holy Roman Empire. So, Judith was defending a small state threatened by an empire, so were the German Protestants. But note that this Judith is not as dangerous or as sexually charged, although I would still say she looks pretty self-satisfied. But really, she looks more like she's about to head to the library, appropriate for a religious movement very heavily focused on reason and the written word. So this is a new addition to this uh, slideshow and lecture, one that I'm very excited about. When we study the art of Americas, we will learn about paintings that were made by native Indian artists under the instruction of Catholic Baroque painters. The Spanish conquerors were very eager to use art to help convert the native peoples <clears throat> to Catholicism. But what I love about this work is how the Inca painter 
a little subversively through in Inca symbols. We don't actually absolutely know that this is the story of Judith and Holofernes. <clears throat> is it Judith or is this an Incan princess fighting back against her captors? Well, stay tuned for the Last Supper with the roast guinea pig as the main course and Judas wearing the face of Francisco Pizarro. And now we fast forward again, this time to the age of revolution. Goya began his career as a court painter for the Spanish royal family. When Napoleon invaded Spain and a vicious guerrilla war erupted, the term guerrilla or small war actually dates from the Spanish rebellion, Goya became one of the most famous chroniclers of the horrors of war. This etching is in fact one of the college board's required images. Stay tuned. This, although it's one of the most famous paintings in art history, did not make the college board cut. It did make ours. Uh, the scene shows Spanish partisans or guerrilla fighters being executed by French troops. We'll return to this painting later. For now, I'm just establishing some context for Goya's black painting. So this Judith really resembles a Spanish peasant guerrilla fighter. And trust me, the women in this war were often proof of Rudyard Kipling's famous lines. I'm going to quote a poem here. When the Himalayan peasant meets the he-bear in his pride, he shouts to scare the monster who will often turn aside. But the she-bear, thus accosted, rends the peasant tooth and nail for, and this is the famous line in his poem, the female of the species is more deadly than the male. And... Speaking of deadly Judas, we move on to Gustav Klimt. Now, Judith has always been more than a little dangerous. It's hard not to interpret the story that way. Some artists have also chosen to make her sexy. Others have not. But here at the dawn of the 20th century, Judith has become a femme fatale. She using her sex as a weapon. Klimt was a leading artistic figure in turn-of-the-century Vienna, Austria, which was a hotbed of new ideas. Sigmund Freud was practicing psychology in Vienna, and in his writings, which were widely distributed and talked about in Vienna at the time, he attributed most human motivations to sex. Female sexuality in the Freudian world was also often tinged with aggression. Women are kind of scary in Freud's world. On that, by the way, is going to be true, as we'll see in a lot of 20th century art. So this is basically a Judith who got off on whacking Hall of Herenace. Vienna was a center of Jewish scholarship and financial leadership as well. And, perhaps not unrelated to that, it was a hotbed of virulent anti-Semitism or hatred of Jews. Klimt was controversial, and to make a living, he had to turn to Jewish patrons who had money. In fact, he was accused of being a Jew lover. The model for the Judith on the left was, in fact, a prominent Jewish society woman, and she would have been recognized as such by her fellow Viennese. In some ways, the painting may even have played into v Vienna's anti-Semitism. This is a Jewish woman who is exotic and foreign and more than a little bit dangerous. Moser is another Viennese painter, but this slightly later work reflects the influence of World War I on painting and indeed on all of European cultural life. Its style is what's called expressionist. In other words, the artist is seeking to depict not so much the objective reality as the subjective emotions and responses that objects and events arouse. But note, too, that this Judith is much less heroic, much less sensual, much more violent in keeping with the world awash in what many saw as senseless violence. So here's another of one of the college board's required works, the one you just saw is not. It's from the same period. Not much heroism here, is there? Cosimo de' Medici would have been shocked. Well, as my kids used to say, my bad. I can no longer find the artist's name or the date for this work. Uh, but clearly the painting is a takeoff, or more politely, an homage to Artemisia Gentileschi's painting. And equally clearly, it's a 20th century work. So what contextual change might have inspired an artist to abandon Gentileschi's startling realism for what is essentially a collection of geometric shapes? Well, one answer is the arrival of photography. Now artists could basically produce extraordinary realism without years of learning how to wield a paint, paintbrush and use oil paint. 
And one result of the rise of photography was a new artistic drive to capture the essential shapes and contours of objects. In other words, to have what was called non-representational art, although you can still see what this picture is about, so it's not really wholly non-representational. This one clearly is. This is pure emotion conveyed with abstract art. Now, this is a very recent painting, as you'll see, but it actually recalls an artistic movement that was very popular immediately after World War II, especially in New York, called Abstract Expressionism, where there was a further rejection of representational art in an attempt to capture sort of pure emotion. And again, we'll look at more of these paintings toward the very end of our course. This shouldn't come as a big surprise. Judith proved to be a very popular subject with late 20th century feminist artists. Gotta love that bloody purse. Sorry, I couldn't find the artist or date for this one either. It was on a gallery website and it seems to have disappeared. So, why would Barbie be chosen to represent Judith? As we get into late 20th and early 21st century art, we're going to see more and more artists both appropriating and critiquing popular culture. And for me personally, I've always found Barbie and Ken more than a little creepy. This is actually the only Judith and Holofernes image that's on the College Board list. It's a staged, highly artificial photograph intended as an imitation and to some extent, of course, a mockery of Baroque art. I asked a question on your study guide, I'll ask again. Why do you think she made Judith's feet so big? What point is this? And why does she use a Halloween mask as Holofernes' head? I'm not actually going to try to answer these questions in the podcast, though I hope we'll discuss them in class. We will return to this work later when we know a lot more about the art that she is imitating and mocking. So, does anyone recognize Holofernes' head? That's Joseph Stalin, the dictator of communist Russia in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And this was painted just four years after the fall of communism in Russia. Now, I think Cosimo de' Medici pro would probably like this one, down with tyranny. By now, I hope you'll all have a better idea of what I mean by the very important term context. What religious or political views shaped an artist's thinking? What did patrons of that era ask for and why? What social, economic, political, or religious power did they represent? How did artists choose to support or, in many cases, to rebel against or challenge the social, religious, political structure of their time? This is what puts the history in art history. In my final lecture, I'll focus more on the art, or what art historians call formal analysis. We'll still see some of these works again, but we'll look at them from a different perspective.